everyone and welcome to the first Indonesia study group uh, on campus in uh, 15 months or something like that, certainly for well over a year. So in fact it was sold out and sold out very quickly and um, uh, a lot of us are very glad to be back face to face and to have kind of wise and chance like online. So thank you very much for coming. And what better way to launch uh, renewed on-campus ISG uh, seminars and to have one of our, um, our great colleagues, uh, Marcus Meitzner, uh, talking about contemporary Indonesian political development. So, as most of you will know, Marcus is Associate Professor of Indonesian Politics in the Department of Political and Social Change. And uh, the subject that he has uh, for his talk today is about Partai Democrat, coerced power sharing, Jokowi, Partai Democrat, and the shrinking of Indonesia's opposition. So, Marcus will speak for about 45 minutes, and then um, we'll have um, question and answers and comments. We'll finish at 2 o'clock. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much, Greg. And uh, like Greg, I'm also uh, very happy to see all of you here. The only thing I'm missing is the muting button, right? So if you start. <laughs> uh, also, remember, if you get bored and you want to chat to your neighbor, you can't just turn off the video. <laughs> so we need to all get used to the old um, way of doing things. Okay, so I'm talking today about the Partei Democrat crisis, but I'm going to situate that in a sort of broader historical uh, context because, as I will argue, um, the events around Partei Democrat and its crisis uh, in the last few months is, in essence, nothing new. We have seen similar patterns um, before. Uh, and so here's the structure I'm uh, going to go through. So first we're going to look at the rainbow coalitions under Yudhoyono, because again, the effort of Indonesian presidents of building oversized coalitions is nothing new, and Yudhoyono uh, had engaged in that enterprise uh, as well, but as I will show in a slightly different uh, manner. Then we're going to analyze Jokowi's minority alliance in 2014. He came to power with a much smaller coalition uh, initially when he was elected and claimed at the beginning that that was not a problem. He then changed his mind uh, quickly later on and started to build a much larger coalition as Yudhoyono had done before. So then looking very closely at how exactly he's done it, and this is where we're going to see some diversions from the way uh, Yudha Yono approached the issue. We're looking at the Golkar and Pitiga cases in 2015 and 2016, and that was, as I will uh, argue, the blueprint for the Partai Democrat crisis as, as well. Also important to remember that this attempt in 2021 to take over Partei Democrat was not the first. It had occurred before uh, in 2015, surrounding the Congress in Surabaya uh, at the time. And then, you know, some more in detail, we're going to look at the events of uh, 2021, the takeover attempt um, that is still ongoing, whether it will eventually succeed or not, uh, we don't know. And then finally, some explanations and um, an outlook. Okay, so let's start by looking at the rainbow cabinets under Yudhoyono. Because again, Indonesian presidents have traditionally sought to build oversized coalitions, which means coalitions that have more than just 50% plus of the seats in uh, parliament. So here we have the uh, first Yudhoyono cabinet that evolved in his first term. We should also remember that when uh, Yudhoyono came to power, he too initially had a minority coalition, but it expanded pretty quickly into uh, one that was uh, significantly larger than at election time. So this is data here from Dan Slater. Uh, so at the height of his power in the first term, Yudhoyono controlled 73% uh, of the seats in Parliament. Importantly, however, is to look at how this was 
uh, done. So we see two parties here that weren't initially uh, part of the Yudha Yono team in the election, this is Golkar and Fitiga. So how did these parties become members of the Yudha Yono uh, coalition? And the key event in this regard was this one, December 2004, the Golkar Congress in Bali, where the then chairman, Akbar Tanjung, who had uh, pledged to keep Golka in opposition, was defeated by the man on the right side here, Yusuf Kala, the vice president of Yudhiyono. So essentially what we had in this case was an open contest at a congress between supporters of the government and their opponents. Right? So Akbar Tanjung at the time had argued we should not be joining the Yudhiyono government, uh, Golkar's position, uh, should be outside the government uh, in a coalition with PDIP. Uh, and Yusuf Kala, obviously, as the vice president, had the opposite appeal. So this was an interesting event, and this was discussed very uh, openly in the Congress. What should we be doing as a party? Is it better for us to join uh, the government? Is it better for us to stay outside of it? Of course, a lot of money changed hands. Uh, and at the end, um, uh, Yusuf Kala won the contest, and therefore Golkar entered the Yudhoyono uh, coalition. And with that, Yudhoyono's standing as a president became much uh, stronger. Petiga, something similar happened later on. Suyadama so Ali took over the party, uh, took it very strongly into a pro Yudhoyono uh, position. So at the end of all of these processes of political contestation within those parties, we had the result that we had just seen 73% of uh, parliament seats under control uh, of UDO. Similar things occurred in the second term, of course, we had a much larger <coughs> nominating coalition this time for Yudhiyono. Yudhiyono was a very successful uh, first term incumbent. He was widely predicted to win uh, the 2009 elections. So significantly more parties lined up behind him uh, to nominate him in 2009. But not all of them did. Uh, Golka, again, was not part of that coalition because uh, Yudhiyono had broken with Kala and Kala decided to run on his own. Uh, wasn't very successful uh, in doing so, uh, but at the beginning of the second term, Golka was officially outside of the Yudhiyono uh, coalition. But then, again, a Golkar Congress that decided how Golkar would orient itself towards uh, the Yudhiyono uh, government. So on the right hand here, these were the two candidates in the 2009 uh, Golkar Congress, Abdul Rizal Bakri, who uh, stood for inclusion of Golkar into the Yudhiyono government. On the left here, um, uh, Suya Palo, who was his rival at the Congress, wanted to keep Golka outside of the Yudhiyono uh, administration. So again, we had this contest. Again, a lot of money changed hands. And at the end, uh, Bakri emerged victorious. And Golka joined formally the Yudhiyono coalition, which then led uh, again, to this map here, 75.5% of DPR seats, parliament seats, under the control of the government. Then Slater has described this process as promiscuous power sharing, right, where parties almost naturally are in the process of uh, you know, approaching the power center, right? So parties, political parties in Indonesia are generally built in a way that leads them towards government participation. That has to do with the spoils that are distributed in the power center and so forth, the patronage that's available. And so parties, most of them, will seek inclusion in the government coalition. And again, he calls that uh, promiscuous uh, power sharing. In other work, he has uh, compared that to a cartel. Right, where parties come together. Uh, I actually like the term promiscuous power sharing more. Uh, cartel, I think, is a bit problematic. But yes, what happened 
in those unilateral um, uh, coalitions in the first and the second was certainly an exercise of large-scale power sharing that went well beyond what would have been necessary to secure a 50 plus 1 percent majority for the president in uh, the power. But we've seen how this was done. This was largely done through congresses in which the two opposing sides, pro-government and, you know, and anti-government forces, fought it out. And often these results were very close. And they were accepted by the losing side. Uh, in the case of Surya Palov, of course, he then decided, as a result of his uh, loss in the 2009 Volga Congress, to just build his own party, uh, Nastem, which is now in the Jacobi uh, coalition. We see something similar, of course, in the Philippines, where often parties and members of parliament, after an election, uh, run towards the winner of the elections, right? Uh, just sort of shed any alliances they had prior to the election and just join the pro government government faction. So we see a version of that in Indonesia as well. However, when Jacobi ran in 2014, some of you might remember that, one of his sort of big mantras was this approach is a mistake. Right? These oversized coalitions, they hold presidents for ransom, uh, policy making is ineffective. I don't need big coalitions. I can rule with much smaller, much slimmer ones, uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that. So here is the coalition he ran with in 2014, which controlled about uh, 37 or 38 percent of the DPR seats, the parliament seats. Uh, and he said throughout the campaign, I don't need more. And I interviewed him just briefly before he was sworn in, and I raised that again and again with him. Do you really think you can rule with such a small coalition? Don't you think you will need parliament in order to rule efficiently? And he said, no, 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 no. I'm the president. I know what my rights are constitutionally. And he said, watch me. Of course, it didn't take long for him to change his mind. In fact, probably in a week or two after his inauguration, he started to uh, have second thoughts about the wisdom of not building uh, a broader coalition. So, yeah, and this is what happened with Yudhiyono as well at the very beginning when then the oppositional side in parliament takes over the leadership positions of parliament, takes over the commissions and so forth. This is exactly what happened in the early uh, Jokowi period um, as well. So the first warning shot for Jokowi came in fact with the announcement of the cabinet right, where he had uh, drawn up his list and he had in fact given to journalists a time where he would announce the cabinet and then phone calls came in and most importantly for Megawati saying well if you appoint that person and in this case uh, Mawara Sirai then forget about PDIP supporting your coalition we will withdraw uh, and so Jokowi canceled the announcement at the time of cabinet. And then, of course, Babwa Asarai was not uh, appointed Minister of Sports, which is what Megawati had uh, so passionately uh, spoken out against, because she didn't like him and there were uh, suggestions of disloyalty and so forth. Uh, but she made her point, you can only rule with my help and you can only rule with parliamentary support. And if you, know, you don't play ball, we are going to uh, withdraw that. That was the moment where Jacobi knew he needed to build a bigger coalition, not only to control parliament, but also to become more independent of, uh, of PDRP. And the first party to go in that respect was PAN. Right? It was the first party to be broken out of the opposition at the time uh, headed by Prabowo and 
uh, Bakri, uh, who held the majority in Parliament. Now, the way Pan switched sides was very similar to what had happened under Yudhya. It was a proper Congress. So we had uh, Hatta here on the left side, who had run with Kabo in 2014 as his vice presidential candidate, uh, losing out against Sokifli Hassan here on the right side. Sokifli Hassan was much more friendly towards the Jokowi government than Hatta was, and it was a very close result, I think just a handful of votes. Uh, but from March 2015, Han was under the control of a pro-Jokowi uh, politician. That was the first step in increasing um, the Jokowi coalition. But this is where the similarities end with the Yudhiyono period, because now we have the decisive moves coming in 2015 and 2016, and that was breaking out Golkar and Petiga from the pro Prabowo uh, coalition. And that was a much harder thing to do, because both parties were unwilling to join the coalition. And they also had... Uh, not the same mechanisms as we had seen in the past. Again, so here uh, a new sort of approach, strategic approach was developed uh, as a blueprint of how to deal with these problems. And again, I'm arguing this is in fact what we have seen with the Partido Democrat uh, approach as well. So that approach, both in terms of Gorka and Petiga, followed through five steps. Number one, we would have a pro Jokowi faction in each party holding a counter Congress. Uh, they said, we are politicians in our various parties who are siding with the president, but we don't have a chance in our various parties to get hurt. In fact, we believe that our various parties are manipulated by uh, politicians who are uh, in opposition to the president. So, so these pro Jokowi factions hold their counter congresses because they've lost out in the main congresses, which were invariably won by anti Jokowi politicians. The second step in that blueprint then is that the government, which holds the power, and that is crucial here. In Indonesia, the government holds the power to recognize the legality of a particular uh, leadership of a political party. That has to do with the fact that in order to participate in elections in Indonesia, a political party has to go through two main steps. One is registration with the Ministry of Human Rights, uh, Law and Human Rights. That gives you the legal recognition as a political party. And then if you want to participate in elections, you still have to register with the KBU, the Electoral Commission. Right? So these are the two steps, but the government as the executive controls the first step. Right? So the Minister of Law and Human Rights, the Minister of Justice and, and Human Rights, which at the time just so happened to be, as it is now, the cadre of the government party, um, of PDIP, Persona. It's in his hands to decide whether or not to accept any faction of a party that comes to the ministry and says, we want our counter board, leadership board, to be registered and recognized by um, the government. Main problem, and I've said this many times in public events in the last few weeks uh, in Indonesia, that authority to recognize the legality of a party board should not rest with the executive, and especially not when that ministry, of course, is held by a party cadre. It's just uh, nonsensical to do it this way. This authority should be given to the KPU or some other more neutral uh, institution. But that second step is absolutely crucial. And unsurprisingly, in both of these cases, when pro Jokowi forces in Volcar and Kitiga came to the government and said, we held a counter congress, here's our result, please recognize it. In both cases, the government did that. 
and it essentially declared the anti-Jogowi leadership boards under Bakri and Surya Dhamma Ali as illegal. So that's step number two. Parallel to that, there is a campaign of intimidation towards these anti-government boards. So coincidentally or not, Surya Dhamma Ali at the height of this Congress was arrested for corruption. Now I'm not saying that he didn't deserve that, uh, but there's many other politicians in Indonesia who would deserve that, but weren't arrested at that particular period of time. With Golka, same thing. Bakri deserves a lot of what's coming uh, for him, but the government was very clear to him. If you have an interest in keeping your businesses, you better play ball. And in the Golka case, actually, it's important to note that the Bakri faction ultimately won its court case. But at that stage, it didn't matter anymore because Bakri had decided it wasn't worth it. He literally said, I now know the government wants me to leave. You know, I'm in a situation uh, that is no longer tenable for me and my businesses, so I'm going. And so he negotiated an exit deal with the government at which you know, he would remain in the party as the head of the uh, Dewan Kabina, sort of the, the supervisory board of the party. But there would now be a pro we politician installed uh, at the next Congress, and that turned out to be uh, Setya Novanto. Right, so Jokowi had expressed at many occasions uh, his sympathy for Setya Novanto, the way he was able to manage the DPR. He was sort of, sort of politician who got deals done for uh, the government. So that's step number four. In, in, in both of these cases, we then had a uniting Congress, which essentially established the pro Jokowi leadership boards as the legal representatives of each political party. And the fifth step then was uh, those parties joined the Jokowi uh, coalition. So again, here these, these pictures, so Suya Dama Ali uh, on the left, uh, he again was arrested for corruption and was entering in debates with the government about you know, what will I get if you know, I give up my fight for the leadership, right? And so he eventually did. So he sent a letter uh, saying, I'm stepping down, I'm giving up my claim on the leadership. Uh, and in the case of Golka, we had a Congress again where uh, Setya Novanto was uh, installed as the new, as the new leader. Okay, so then we have 2009, uh, 2019, and very similar to the second Yudhiyono term, a much bigger coalition that nominated the incumbent president. Uh, the ANU Library wants us all to stay safe. a much bigger nominating coalition for uh, Jokowi, roughly about 60% of the parties. Again, uh, we call that for 2014, he only had the support of parties that represented 37% of the parliament seats, now a much larger uh, coalition. But still, there were four parties that had not uh, joined the coalition at that time. The first one to go, as you probably know, was Garindra. So there was a deal struck between Jokowi and Prabowo, which brought Prabowo into 
the coalition and gave him the defense ministry, and that brought the Jokowi coalition up to about 74, 75% of control of power. It gets him roughly to the levels that Yudhiyono uh, was uh, used to. And again, there's, you know, there was, in, in this particular case, there was no coercion. This was probably in the line of Slater's approach of promiscuous power sharing, Kobobo getting frustrated after all these years of running as an opposition candidate, he finally wanted to be in government. Jacobi saw the benefits of that, so they did come to an agreement. So uh, nothing really wrong with that. However, then we see other parties also moving towards uh, the Jacobi government. The first one uh, is Pan, which you know, had broken off the Jokowi coalition briefly for the nomination of Babobo in 2019, largely under the pressure of Armin Reis, who was sort of the, a patron of the party. But then another Congress in February 2020, and the anti-government faction of Pan under Armin Reis essentially leaves the party at that stage, leaving it under Sopifli Hassan, who uh, is very sympathetic to uh, to Jokowi. Since then, Pan has not officially joined the coalition, uh, has not officially joined the cabinet, but it's voting invariably with the government on all important matters, for instance, the omnibus law and so forth. Pan is very loyal in its voting behavior uh, when it comes to government proposals. Uh, obviously with the hope that in the next reshuffle, and you know, we hear that that's coming very soon, uh, that Pan again will be rewarded with another cabinet seat. So after this Congress, if you take Pan as a very government-friendly party into this coalition, um, the pro-government side in Parliament uh, grew to 82%. So we are now at a level uh, already that is unprecedented in uh, post Suharto uh, politics. With Garindra and Pan drawn out of the opposition, we're left with two parties that are not in line with the government, and that's on the left, uh, the Democrat Party, and on the right, uh, PKS, PKS, which went to several uh, sort of changes in its leadership over the last uh, few years, but none of these uh, changes really affected the stance of the leadership of the party to remain without or uh, outside of the Jacobi uh, government. So they've been very firm on that issue. Democrat uh, has always been a bit more ambiguous. Uh, you might not be surprised about that. You don't know there's been ambiguous on, on many things. So uh, Democrat has been a sort of a soft opposition. Right? They say, yeah, we support the government if, it, if it's doing good things, if it's doing not so good things we might oppose. But importantly, it opposed the government on the omnibus bill, which was very important uh, for Jacoby. But anyway, 19% of the EPR seats left to speak against the government. Right? So, let that uh, sink in. So the question is now, of course, why would that bother Jacoby or the government? You know, why even then try to even you know, break out Democrat from its oppositional stance and trying to uh, water down its uh, opposition? So stepping back a little bit before we get to the 2021 events, this was actually not new. We had seen a prelude to that already in 2015 at the Congress of Partido Democrat in uh, Surabaya, which I attended at the time. Uh, so this is a picture I took of SBY the evening before. Um, and we had a long chat about uh, what was happening in the party. What was happening was exactly the same what we see at the moment. There were, of course, um, elements within the party. This was one year 
after Yogi Ono had retired from the presidency, who were expressing disappointment. In the 2014 elections, the faction of Democrat had shrunk by about two thirds. Clearly, you know, the president was no longer there. His party got a much smaller result. So there were a lot of people in the party who were unhappy. They knew uh, sort of SBY's era was over, and they were looking for a new political home, a new political orientation. So all kinds of people were popping up around the Congress saying that SPY had failed to lead the party and it was time now to hold a Congress to elect a non-SPY leader, pretty much in the way we had seen that uh, happening in Gorkar and in Bitiga. In fact, a new uh, verb was created at the time, which the press used widely. That was Mungol Karkan. And uh, <laughs> SPY said at the time, Kami Jangan Di Golkarkan. Right? <laughs> Let's not turn us into a Golkar. Because what was happening parallel to this was the treatment of Golkar that I just explained. That a counter congress pops up, that counter congress gets acknowledged by the government as the legal one and therefore uh, the current leader of the party, in this case SBY, would lose control of the party. Now, SBY and his sons were actually quite quick to bring this to the attention of the media. In fact, there was a meeting in the DPR and IBAS, Julianos. Uh, son who was the uh, chair of the uh, faction at the time, he said in an official meeting with the president, one of those official consultation forums with the president, he reminded uh, the president, Jokowi, that that was not on. Now basically sending a signal, we know what you're doing, we know what your plans are, and again that word, jangan kita di golkakan. So, this was already out there long before the Congress. Now, how did SBY respond to that? He's a smart guy. So he invited Jokowi to the Congress, knowing, of course, that Jokowi's presence at the Congress would make it impossible to later on declare it illegal. Right? So if then a counter-Congress would come, to the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights and said, yeah, we want to be declared as legal, Yudhi Yono could say, but yeah, the president attended ours, and that makes it legal. So there was a lot of effort put into getting Jokowi there, uh, and he knew what you know, the implications of his presence would be. So he initially was very careful not to commit to come. It was then Uhud Sitompo, out of all people, uh, who managed to get uh, Jokowi to Surabaya. And he had been in Papua before, and Uhud, you know, sort of the master politician of Indonesian politics, so Uhud had been in Golkar as long as Golkar was in power. Then he moved to Democrat when SBY was in power, and now you can guess in which party he is. <laughs> in the IP. Right, so at the time he was in transition. Uh, between various parties. So he was in Democrat, but he had campaigned for the whole week uh, in 2014. So to cut the long story short, uh, Jokowi came to the Congress, and with that, the possibility of a counter-Congress was essentially uh, killed. So the matter was settled um, at the time. And it's important to understand that prehistory uh, to contextualize what came uh, later. So what happened this year? Everything started with March 2020. So we had the Congress there where Yudhiyono handed over the leadership of the party to his son, uh, Ahai Agus. In that Congress, there were a number of people who over the years had played a role in the party that were sort of shifted out, as it normally happens in every Congress. There are some people who win, some people who lose. But in this case, there were 
quite a number of the older ones who believed that they had played a big role in securing SBY's success over the years, they were shifted out. And here are some of those. Uh, Johnny Allen Marbon, you know, who uh, was sort of a, a, a really hands-on sort of Kremann type who had every party <laughs> mobilized over the years, was one of those who lost a position after 2020. <coughs> Max uh, Sabakur as well, sort of an elderly, part of elderly, there were lots of others like him as well, who were still accommodated in the 2015 to 2020 leadership board now shifted out. And of course, they were unhappy and they mobilized and they started talking to each other. You know, how can we still stay relevant? And what is the direction we want to put the party on? Another one of these nice gentlemen who was <coughs> on the side of these people who you know, were marginalized from the party. So Nazaruddin uh, just you know, timely released from prison uh, in order to help funding the counter congress in uh, North uh, Sumatra. So we have a lot of people who feel marginalized under RIE. They have a lot of material, of course, um, saying that you know it's not enough to have the son of a former president um, heading the party. We can't be satisfied with, with just 7% of the votes. Uh, we want a counter Congress. And so they start having debates about who the best person would be, because among them there's no one, as you can see, who would really have the caliber uh, to do that. So they're starting to approach uh, people. We've learned later on that Gato Nomianto, uh, the former uh, TNI commander, was one of them, but he says that he rejected that approach. Uh, so finally, uh, this group settled on Moldova, also a former TNI commander. But very importantly, and you know, the Indonesian government would want to make you believe that that doesn't matter. But it does matter that this is the chief of staff of the president. Right? So he has been a key assistant to Jacobi. He is leading his uh, office, the KSP. So he is somebody, you know, comparable to chiefs of staffs in other presidential systems or uh, chiefs of staffs in parliamentary systems, chiefs of staffs to uh, prime ministers. So that's the person they settled on. And they knew that Moldova was looking because he has ambitions that go well beyond just being uh, the chief of staff of the president. We actually believe for a long time, and so did many others, that he would be the pick for vice president uh, in 2019. I heard he had already shirts printed on that um, <laughs> famous Thursday afternoon when everything sort of fell apart, but he took it in good humor. Uh, but he was looking. It was very clear he was preparing for a future beyond um, Jacobi. So here's where these two interests come together. So there are people in the Democratic Party that are marginalized, and somebody who feels that he needs a party to be competitive for 2024. And so in Waldoko's words, we had a few coffees, nopi nopi, uh, and that came to the attention, of course, very quickly, um, to of Ahaye and SBY as well. So pretty similar to the approach the Udiono family had taken in 2015, the first time when they heard about these attempts, they leaked it to the press and said, we know what's happening. This is what Ahaye did this time as well, a quite famous press conference now on the 1st of February uh, 2021, where he said, I just wrote a letter to the president explaining to him what his chief of staff is doing uh, he tries to take over this party. Uh, we don't think that this is something the president should condone, and we would like the president to comment on that uh, issue. I think this was a, a, a crucial step in order to later on uh, explain the outcome of the whole affair. 
just as AHIE and SPY had predicted a month later, Wuldogo, who in the meantime, of course, had said, I don't know what you're talking about. I just had a few coffees with your people, and they talked to me about international development and so forth. Surely enough, a month later, we have Moldoko taking over the party exactly in the way that you know, Ahaye had described in the letter. Now the president said, well, I'm surprised that you know, my chief of staff uh, did that. I, I, I didn't know. Uh, and by the way, it's his political right. I think roughly, that was, that was the approach. Of course, between the 1st of February, that press conference by Ahaye, and the 5th of March, when it actually happened, the Indonesian newspapers were full. Not only the Indonesian newspapers, the foreign newspapers were also full about exactly what was going to happen, and it was followed uh, step by step. And so uh, this was the man, because Jacobi didn't really want to talk about it, so Jacobi sent his uh, senior security and politics minister forward. He said, yeah, Jacobi was really surprised about this, uh, but yeah, he was uh, happy, happy, I can. <laughs> he was okay with it. And that became sort of the line of the government, that there was nothing problematic about this that the chief of staff of the president, who has private political rights, can go out and take over one of the two remaining opposition parties. I mean, that's perfectly unproblematic in that narrative of events. I mean, you just would have to imagine that you know, Morrison's chief of staff goes out and tries to take over the Greens or something like that. But this is really what we're talking about here, we can't talk in any plausible way about a scenario in which the president had no idea what his chief of staff was about to do. And if he didn't, that would be equally problematic. <laughs> and he did then, let's say for generosity's sake, he didn't know. Then of course once he did know what was happening, uh, the only way for him to resolve this would have been to uh, relieve Moldoko of his office, which he obviously uh, did, not, did not do. Okay, so then we come to the uh, preliminary climax of this. Um, the pro-Moldoko faction applied for legal recognition with the government, as previous uh, pro-government factions in Golkar and Petiga had done, but this time the government rejected the recognition. Right? And so, of course, the question is, why did it not follow through with the same procedure that it had followed through in uh, 2015 and 2016 with Golkar and Bitiga? Number of reasons for that. First of all, there was a big public backlash. I mean, even for a very cynical Indonesian public, this was a bit too much. This whole idea that the chief of staff sort of had private political rights about which the president doesn't necessarily have to know, that didn't fly. Uh, and the Udiono side actually was very smart in the way they played this. Uh, and they are now actually ecstatic about it. I just had a Zoom meeting with them last week. They said, this is fantastic. We have this, uh, we have this sympathy effect. They had all the media studies, how you know, the media has sided with them and so forth. So that did play uh, a, big, a big role. The second reason is that even for the very sympathetic Ministry of Justice and Human Rights under a PDRP cadre, the way this was done was amateurish and stood in quite stark contrast to the way the Gorka and Petiga Congresses had been run in 2015 and uh, 2016. So the 2015 and 2016 Congresses, they were run by party insiders, professionals, and so forth, who knew what they were doing. They also knew what the paperwork would have to look like in order to get accepted, and so forth. This one was a very different animal. So you know, the Congress that was held in North Sumatra, they brought in together a few people. They claimed they were 1,200. A uh, representative of branches turned out there was just one uh, member of a provincial uh, branch and 34 of 
couple patent level branches. That was it. Everyone else was sort of a pungambira or whatever you want to call them. But it was very hard to even explain to the ministry why, based on what, uh, they should acknowledge the legality. Again, very few people, credibly, from inside the party were involved. Probably the most prominent, Mazuki Ali. And probably it would have gone a bit differently had Mazuki Ali taken a bigger role in this. But so we had these people, the people I showed you earlier, running the show, and they had not a very high uh, credibility. Then there was the general effect, the sympathy effect for Yudhiyono. Right? So he, uh, again, you can say, totally over-dramatized press conference, uh, where he, again, you know, sort of talked about the pain and, and so forth that was inflicted on him. Uh, but he is a, is a different figure than, let's say, Bakri or Suyadam Ali, for whom at the time was very, there was very little public sympathy. So there's still, let's say, 10, 15% the electorate for SPY in Indonesia that feels very strongly uh, about the former uh, president and that also played uh, a role here. It's also important, and this, it was misunderstood, I think, by uh, quite a number of people, including within Partai Demokrat, because they believe it's now over, but it's actually not. We only see now the beginning of the court proceedings, right? And so the government can actually say, well, for us, we couldn't necessarily, you know, declare this kind of Congress legal, but maybe some other judge will, yeah, because this is where the Muldoko camp will now go, and we've seen this in so many other cases, Golka and Vitiga, this could drag on for years, uh, and as I would argue, that is actually part of the plan. So stepping in, you know, one more step back and ask why did the government or elements associated with it launched the takeover attempt in the first place. Again, even without Democrat, they controlled 82% of parliament seats. Why would you even bother? Why is it important to drag the remaining opposition parties into pro-government space in the first place? Now, there's a lot of discussion uh, about one potential explanation, and that is that Jokowi wants to prepare for a third term. For that, he needs a change of the Constitution, and a change of the Constitution uh, has a very high bar. And the more seats you control in the DPR, and then subsequently the NPR, the safer it would be uh, to launch such an attempt. Right? So any change in the Constitution would have to be made in the NPR. There you have uh, members of the DPD, the senators, that are much more difficult to control. So if you could add more, so if you could control 91% of the DPR, not 82%, well, that would take you uh, into that direction. I don't know whether that is true, but I don't actually think it matters, right? Because whether the takeover, the full takeover of the party and the near absolute control of the DPR and MPR may have been the goal, the maximum goal. I think elements within the palace were actually happy to settle for much less. Right? So for them, the outcome of all of this wasn't all that important. Yes, if Moldoko had succeeded, it would have been a great outcome from them, but even if this whole plan falters in the courts, you know, let's say in a year or so after all of that has been dragged through the courts, still the government will have benefited because Democrat has been dragged into a very costly, uh, very damaging legal and political conflict. So at the heart of all of this seems to be the attempt to damage SPY, damage Democrat, damage RIA ahead of the 2024 elections, one way or another. Again, I don't think there was a very concrete goal for this. They just had a goal, and it and see where it will end up. It's important to understand Moldoko's role in all of this, which I think isn't all that important. He was just the one who fell for it, who thought that you know this is good for him. He has a political vehicle. Uh, but most likely he will end up losing 
at all because he's now humiliated, he's most likely to lose the court cases and so forth, uh, then that means he has no vehicle for 2024, but also a damaged um, reputation. But again, I don't think the palace and the people who drove this really care about Moldoko and his political uh, future. Okay, so what does this all mean, just finally, conceptually? So if we look at all these cases in combination, so if we take the Golkat case and the Pitiga case and combine that with what we know about the Democrat case, there's a new type of presidentially controlled power sharing, right? So this is not just, as in the past, promiscuous power sharing in which parties driven by uh, patronage interests and so forth voluntarily want to join the government. Uh, this is actually a case where the president is trying actively and aggressively and coercively, I would argue, to pull parties into the pro-government pro uh, space. So we have initiatives here launched by the president in order to pull initially unwilling parties into the coalition. And again, uh, this is different from what we've seen under Yudhiyon. Right, so there was a natural uh, sort of drive of parties into the government. But here, we actually did have a number of parties that didn't want to be part of the government, but were uh, coerced by uh, the president and his uh, surrounding into rethinking their uh, positions. And why that is happening, again, uh, you know, we could argue about whether 82% you know, is not enough. Jacobi obviously probably didn't think it was, especially if you have constitutional changes uh, in your side. So the, the goal is no longer you know, 50 plus one. That's long, long gone. Now the goal is to have almost uh, full control. And that situates Jacobi as a much stronger president than we would have in the sort of normal promiscuity model. Right, where the president, or the cartel model, where the president is almost a pawn of the political parties, right? where the president is an exchangeable leader who just provides the access for parties for patronage. Here you have a president uh, who is very clear about what he wants, uh, very blunt about the methods that are being taken against political parties that are not siding with uh, the government. Uh, and Indonesia's democratic, democratic fabric uh, is damaged as a result. Thank you. Okay, we have about um, 35 minutes for questions and comments, so please um, raise your hand and let us know who you are, and we begin with Hal. Yes? Uh, no, it's, uh, thanks. Uh, really interesting. By the way, that's our toxic politics in Canberra. Um, just trying to think back, stand back a bit from this sort of desire for an oversized uh, majority. It, you say it makes the president stronger, but it also makes the president weaker, doesn't it? Because there are so many compromises involved in getting that sort of oversized majority that they lose a lot of control. And they lose control over appointments. They obviously lose control over and they become weaker as a result, don't they? I mean, I can see the case, I can see the, I can see the arguments. I mean, it does silence the opposition potentially. Maybe there's a third term in sight, and I don't know what else, maybe insurance, but it does weaken them as much as strengthen them, doesn't it? Yeah, so that would be the case generally, so in the Indonesian presidentialist system, right? So Indonesian uh, presidents are in fact very strong because they have co-legislative powers that other presidents in other presidential systems don't have, right? So other presidents, let's say in the United States, they uh, can use a veto, but in Indonesia, the president has to agree with any legislation. Without the president's agreement, no legislation gets off the ground. So there is a natural strength there already, and that strength was actually advanced by the 2002 uh, constitutional changes. My surprise has always been, you know, and so Ed and I talked at length with Yudhiyono about this, why post-2001 presidents have not made more use of that strength that they have. 
because it is so hard based on the post-2002 amendments to impeach an Indonesian president. It's almost impossible, and we haven't even seen one attempt since then, because it's so impossible. And so you have to go through the DPR, you need a, a, a think two-thirds majority there, then it has to go through the Constitutional Court, then it goes into the MPR, you need another large majority there, and if just one-fourth of the MPR members do not attend the session to impeach the president, it's off. Right, so it's actually incredibly hard to get rid of an Indonesian president. Yet, you know, again, sort of that interview we, we had with Yudi Ono, it was all about, oh, you know, if I, if I don't have a big coalition, then everything Kegaduhan was the word constantly. Yeah, I, I will have chaos and, and so forth. So if I include everyone, then there will be peace, there will be stability, and so forth. Of course, he also said that that actually never happened. Right? But it, is, it has always surprised me that Indonesian presidents have not you know, sort of said, well, you know, I'm actually stronger than you know, this sort of approach of an oversized coalition would suggest. And again, Jokowi said he would, right? So 2014, the entire campaign was this kind of model in the way that you suggest weakens presidents, forces them into compromises, and therefore I want to try something else. Again, it took him one or two weeks to conclude that that didn't, didn't work for him. So we have yet to see a president to actually try to rule in a manner in which the post-2002 amended constitution would allow them to do. That was the big sort of contrast between somebody like Ahok and, and Jokowi. Right? So people who've worked with both have said Ahok would be the president who would rule in the way that the constitution allows him to do. But Jokowi, and immediately after he was challenged, stepped back, right? And we all remember the first political <coughs> crisis in February 2015 over the KPK, where again he panicked and sought to immediately increase his, um, his coalition. By the way, and not only with political parties, that's the book I'm currently writing about, uh, he's not only included into the coalition all of these political parties, but the military, the police, the oligarchs, the bureaucracy, and, and so forth, right? Which are all, I would argue, um, members of a formalized coalition arrangement that produces stability, but in the way that you suggest also produces policy-making paralysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marcus, following that, that it's not just the political parties, but it's also the military. Is there any indication of military role in the uh, counter, um, counter Congress? Uh, uh, the no, I, I don't think institutionally. Uh, both Moldoko and remember Gatot apparently yeah, was Gatot also was a, making, approached, but you know, they're. Uh, sort of outside of the institutional mechanisms at, at the moment. All of them, and that, that applies to Pabolo and you know, whoever has networks within the military, they all control a small part of the military. So we've heard about the presence of some security guards in North Sumatra, but very little. I don't think there was an institutional effort to support it because at the moment, right, so th this is why uh, Jokowi replaced Gatot. He has somebody as the head of the armed forces who he knows from his time in Solo, you know, who is a personal loyalist and who could make sure that that doesn't happen institutionally. But you know, these people have uh, you know, access to people they you know, served under them previously and who are part of their patronage network. Yes, there may have been a handful of military people up in North Sumatra to provide security, but I don't think it, it mattered. Oh. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, um, Marcus, the fact that the Ministry of Law and Human Rights has granted a uh, favorable position to uh, Ahai side, can we take this as a fact that Ahai has uh, finally uh, or completely won the battle? Or is there a possible scenario in the future whereby the court will um, grant 
Yeah. Okay, so now this is, again, I think this is part of what this is all about. Now we have entered this endless arena of legal disputes. So I've spoken to the IE side of things, and they think there's now no case that the Moldoko side could bring against the government uh, at the PPUN, the administrative court, because there's actually no written decision on the rejection of the Moldoko camp. Right? So what Yasona has said, and again, I'm just repeating what the Ahaye side is saying. So Yasona has said, we do not recognize this, but there was no Surapanulakan or whatever you would uh, have to have in order to go to the p n and say, I'm challenging this particular Sura. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure the people in the Moldovo camp will say, we can even challenge the government on not issuing a decision. Right? I can perfectly see that, that you know, some, I don't know, what's the name of that rich, fat lawyer? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paris Hotman. <laughs> Yeah, he could make up a case like that. He say, no, well, you're, 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 you're responsible for that. So again, once you step into the legal space, anything is possible. And I mentioned that, right? So the IA side now feels absolutely certain. There's no case for uh, a review. Uh, but we've seen this in so many other cases. Skolka, Petiga, and Egabe uh, in the past, right? It dragged on for many, many years. And again, my point is, it doesn't really matter how this ends. This is all part of the weakening uh, strategy towards uh, democracy. Oh, yeah. Nava? What about Mekhaes? Why doesn't the government try to pull it in? Is it less threatening, or is it still going to be a kind of kind of response? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Do you want to have a go? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you're not going to tell the Marcus. No, but I, I think, you know, uh, PKS is, in its current form, much more united, much more effective as a party. Uh, as you know, you know, they have their sort of margins that were unhappy. They've already left the party, right? And they've established another one under uh, Anis and, and so forth. So that's in a different kind of kind of box. I think it would be very hard for the government to break up that very tightly organized system of PKS. In terms, and in, count, in terms of counter-congresses, it's very hard with PKS because even we don't know when a congress really, really happens, right? So the leadership there is elected by the Majlis Shuro and then it's endorsed by congresses later on purely for show, right? It would be very hard, I think, to, to do that. But did you, you want to? No, the, exactly. The, I mean, PKS, I think, is rebranding itself for the next election. You know, they've got a slightly new logo, new colour scheme, new uniforms, new um, president. Um, and, yeah, they're repositioning themselves. They're looking very carefully at what they think the obstacles are that they face. And I think they feel that they will be very well placed in 2024. But I don't think that they have any interest in... in and that they know, in fact, that there's almost no prospect of them being invited into the coalition. But that would be the limit of, of the model that Marcus is saying. Where are boundaries? PKS is it, I think. Everything else is on the table but them. It's very interesting um, that Saifun Mujani, you know, who you know, prior to all of this had been very sceptical about this democratic decline narrative. Right? So, he was sort of turned around by this and, and said, you know, this is very obvious now happening, it's very blatant, and you know, there's no alternative way of interpreting this as a, a, a very massive executive intervention into uh, party politics. And what he was most concerned about was that if Democrat is broken off from the opposition, PKS will be the only opposition party left, and his theory was that then you know, people who want to support an opposition party would have no other place to go yeah. uh, than to the Islamist side uh, of, mm. of politics. So that was a very interesting uh, take on that, I thought. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Buri and then Ed. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marcus, for the presentation. Two things that uh, I'm not clear about is, one is uh, the role of PDEP. It, it seemed to me that you seem to be kind of, this is only your way, so PDEP is not having some uh, interest on what Joko will do, or even actually uh, give some suggestion on to do it. So the role of PDP over here seems to me uh, <coughs> interesting. Second is that if Joko can be kind of uh, independent from uh, PDP, he will need some other group, uh, in which the other group that I think you haven't uh, discussed is all these uh, entrepreneur people, CEO uh, or these uh, business people. And what is it exactly these business people uh, want and contribution on this movement? All, all Jokowi activity, if it is absolutely what he wants, needs money yeah, in terms of taking up home, cutting on it. What exactly that group is doing is not clear and, and uh, that probably is my question. Right, so the first thing is, again, you know, if you look at who carried out this takeover attempt, it was the chief of staff of the president. Right? And so there have been lots of attempts to say, well, but look, maybe Jacobi didn't know, maybe other people were involved in that. There is no way around the fact that this was carried out by the person who is closest to the president in terms of day-to-day -day administration. So forgive me if I then conclude that it was Jokowi's surrounding, at least, that drove this. PDRP, and I don't know, I don't claim to know what eventually the decision-making uh, process was. Why Yasona, and who told Yasona to decide in that way? Was it Megawati, was it Jokowi, was it both of them? I don't know, but what I do know is that this was an attempt driven by the Chief of Staff, the President, period. Right? So there isn't really much more we need to look at in terms of who was responsible uh, for this whole narrative. The second, and this is again what I'm writing about in, in the book as well, you know, the role of the oligarchs. I mean, the oligarchs, you know, they don't really exist. They are competing against each other and so forth. So all of them um, seem to have different interests, right? Everyone joins the Jokowi government with a different interest. However, so I, I, I did all of this sort of calculations about which components of presidential coalitions have increased the most over time. And you know, the element that from Yudhiyono to Jokowi to now has increased the most are uh, the oligarchs. And, and the last reshuffle, again, you would know all of this. You know, if you look at these people, you know, they're all millionaires, at least. Some of them multi-millionaires, some of them billionaires, and so forth. So there, there is something here. And I'm not, as you know, I'm not sort of stepping into that uh, sort of conceptual space of Eddie Hadis or, or uh, Richard Robeson, but very clearly, we have to acknowledge that Jokowi is now you know, drawn towards people with a lot of money and with a lot of what he would call uh, business experience. And they're now populating, would be a generous term, colonizing is, an, is a less generous term, they're colonizing uh, the, the cabinet. But again, I, I would not suggest that they all have the same, same interests. I think for Jokowi, it just means these people have shown that they know how to make money, and that means they're good business people, and I want some of this entrepreneurship in my in my cabin. Then, of course, he's under pressure, and we know that. I mean, you know, Lu Hood, Surya Paolo, and all of these people who would tell him to do certain things, and they not, don't tell him the same things, right? They all have uh, competing business interests um, as well. Coming back to what, what held, uh, as we're saying, at the end of the day, he sits on a massively large coalition that he wants, for some reason or another, uh, to keep together um, in order to have probably these opportunities <coughs> that otherwise he wouldn't have. Right? So in political science, we often look at that threshold, right, of, of, uh, the ability to change the Constitution as a, as a major 
threshold that uh, presidents or prime ministers want to pass. Maybe that's what he wants to pass, or he just wants, like SPY, to have peace and everyone being in the tent rather than outside. Yeah. I wonder if you care to comment on the historical parallels, because as you know, and we've talked about this briefly, this is, I mean, there are, it's so reminiscent of the new order period, right? I mean, Virtually every party, every head ego or PDI Congress, there'd be uh, a conflict and rival boards and a Congress who are the answer and government recognition of one of the boards and so on. So, to what extent do you think this is, you know, is there some sort of continuity to that pattern or is this just sort of ad hoc adaptation to the needs of the I, th I mean, obviously, the electoral framework is different and so forth, you know, PDI and at the time, they were operating under very different circumstances in each election. But the source of the problem is the same, right? And that is this government authority to declare a party leadership legal or not. And that was never changed after the Suharto era. And my point you know, now repeatedly to Indonesians has been that has to be changed. Give it to, and we, we know that the KPU is not entirely independent either, but certainly more independent uh, than, than the ministry. And yes, in, in fact, my prediction you know, for a Muldoko Democrat party would have been very similar to the PDE in 1997. I remember when uh, Megawati was pushed out and uh, then at the election, they got, I think, 3% or 25 or whatever it was. I don't think Muldoko would have gotten even close to that right? because he has no relationship to the party. His approval ratings you know, as presidential candidate are not even at 1%. They're at 0.0%. <laughs> There's just no attraction for a Muldoko-led Democrat party. So it would have probably been a 0 point something party. But again, I think like for Sahara, that was part of the plan. Yeah, Ross. How plausible is it that, that, that this is really just about 2024 and therefore, and, and in particular about making sure that there's not an Anis bus wait and an RKA ticket mm -hmm. and, you know, with, with SBY and the cronies funding that, that group with PKS on board and therefore it's not about going from 82% to 91% and Slate as promiscuity model doesn't really matter. This isn't, this isn't about Jacoby's current presidency, it's about 2024. Yeah, well, the, the two are, are interrelated, right? So whatever is in preparation for 2024 uh, comes out of the current government constellation. I, I fully agree with you, and I have this point there, right? So the main goal here was, as the minimum goal, right? I think the way you know, Jogowi's sort of surrounding went into this was with the maximum goal and the minimum goal, right? So the maximum goal probably was, you know, if everything goes to plan, if everything goes perfectly well, we might end up with 91% in the parliament, that would be great. And then we can think about constitutional change and so forth, maximum goal. But we might settle for just doing the damage to RIA, which is what they thought is happening now. Again, the RIA camp says exactly the opposite is happening. Uh, you know, everyone feels, uh, you know, sorry for us and therefore, uh, our approval rating goes up, which it actually did for our year in some of the recent uh, uh, polls, right? So, so, but I fully agree with you. This is about 2024 and making sure that people who might be challenging the preferred constellation, and we don't know what exactly that would be, but you know, taking our year out of the equation takes care of one of the uncertainties in, in, that, in that game. I, I also agree with you that one of these constellations might be Alice with, with I. I think there are certainly discussions about that be, being held. So yes, but it, again, it comes back to what would have been the maximum goal and what would have been the minimum goal. It seems we're settling for the minimum goal, which would be exactly that the destruction of the party or the damage of the party rather than pulling it fully to its side. Other questions or comments? Yes. So. Uh, you have a 
I'm just, um, I'm just wondering whether uh, you can uh, explain the position of other parties within Jokowi's um, coalition about his move to take over the Democrat, because obviously more coalition means it's more portion of the cake for everybody. Yeah, so this is, this is an interesting uh, sort of consideration, and this is why I mentioned the sort of starting point for Jokowi's realization that a mini coalition won't work. And again, this really rapid uh, moving away from what his position was earlier, saying, you know, I'm perfectly happy with just having 37%. What happened later on was once it became clear that you know, PDIP, and remember 2014, 15, 16 were very bad years in the relationship between Jokowi and PDIP, right? So very tense, toxic, I think was the word we heard earlier. Um, and that's where Jokowi realized it would be actually helpful for me to have all of this other support from other parties so I can go to PDIP and say, look, I wanted it to do like Kibu Mega said, but Golka, PKP, pardon, they all said, no, I'm so sorry, please tell Ibu it didn't work. Right? And there were so many of these, and that, that's the other side hell of, of that big coalition. So that's how he has figured it out. He can actually avoid policy positions he doesn't want to take with reference to members of the coalition that allegedly had expressed an opposition um, towards it. So what you always see uh, in the building of a coalition after an election is that insistence of the parties that were initially part of the nominating coalition to not let in anyone else, right? Don't let in Gorka, don't let in these people because they didn't fight for this blah, 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 because exactly for the considerations that, that you mentioned. Now, in the, in the Democrat case, most parties didn't want to have to do anything with it. They just knew this was, you know, a, a toxic thing to touch. And they say, well, you know, we'll see where this is going and so forth. But they, I don't recall anyone in a party to express a clear opinion because they didn't want to be tied to a particular outcome of this. You know, so adopting the official government line saying this is not our business, right? This is an internal party democrat fear, regardless of the fact that the chief of staff of the president is part of it, it doesn't matter, it is still an internal party affair, and that's I think what most of these uh, parties say. Of course, they would have had you know, some reservations about another party joining uh, the, the government, but if you look at how the various elements in coalitions have shifted over time, is that whenever a new party comes in, presidents tend to take that jabda, this quota, from the non-party seats. Right? So it's important to remember that in Indonesian cabinets, roughly sort of half of the seats right, are actually non-party seats. They're technocrats. And when a new party comes in, often one of those technocrats loses his or her job and so that the other parties don't rebel. I actually had a question, Mark Wilson. I wanted to ask whether you thought that um, Jokowi will pay a political price for this, for his credibility. So he clearly wants deniability, saying I wasn't informed by my chief of staff that he was, he was going to do these things. He wants to have this sort of credible deniability and he wants to give this appearance of being at arm's length from the process. But nonetheless, as you have emphasised, he is Jokowi's chief of staff. He must be meeting the president virtually every day. He's also had, at various times during the, since he's been um, the head of the presidential office, he's had a high media profile. So he is now almost unusable as someone who can explain government policies. So his usefulness to Jokowi as a former military leader and the like, that he's now so severely tarnished he can't be used in that context. But also, won't there be, uh, won't there be a lot of people saying, the longer this drags on, surely Jokowi knew about this. Um, this is a, an example of him trying to have a dollar both ways. You know, if Muldoka wins, it's a gain for him. If Muldoka loses, well, eventually, I suppose, he sacks him as, as the chief of staff. But... But nonetheless, in this interim period, while all that is playing out, 
he looks to be the person who doesn't know what's going on inside his presidential office and he's not willing to insert himself to bring this to a satisfactory conclusion, particularly given the, the, the public backlash that you referred to about what a, just what a farce this whole thing has been. So, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like with so many other cases where we would have thought that there is an impact on Jokowi's popularity and then you look at the polls and just nothing happens. I mean, he's very steadily at 70% mm. of popularity, you know, regardless of COVID, regardless of whatever else is happening, regardless of the omnibus bill and the demonstrations that were put down and so forth. Uh, and this is just now another of these of these cases. And you know, part of, and this was interesting to watch, of course the pro Jokowi buzzers came out and they were very systematic about this. Uh, one of the narratives was, you know, crybaby SPY, once again, you know, and he did the same to pick up a poor bestower at the time. Uh, so, assign low and, and so forth, right? So, all that was designed to distract from Jokowi's role in it. And for some people, this actually, this actually works, right? That no, you know, this is, uh, an internal party affair and you know all of these people who say that presidents uh, you know shouldn't intervene in party affairs they should look they should look at what SPY has done in the past with PKB. PKB case I think as you know was a very different uh, differently situated case uh, at the time but you no know, these buzzers are extremely uh, extremely successful mm. you know, and so when I talked to the Democrat people they had some of the examples of this pro-government buzzing and the narrative that was being uh, defended here. And again, Jokowi came out as either not you know, having any role in it or being fully at his rights to say that uh, this is the political right of Moldoko to do this. And of course, combined with a lot of mockery of the SPY family, which you know, in many cases is well deserved. But in, in this particular case, it's not about the whining and the whinging of the Udiono family. It's about a, a principal matter of government intervention into political parties. I was just, I was just wondering, with that um, uh, discussion about credibility, um, whether you would be able to comment whether there are real economic or social outcomes that he he was able to um, achieve over time that give, if you like, that basis for the um, you know, stability and so on, or, uh, public support, if you like. Mm, just before you answer, Mark, sorry, have you finished your question? Yeah. Just before you answer, Charlie also had a question because we've only got a few minutes, so we'll take the two of them together. So, Charlie, do you want to ask? Thanks. Um, I was just wondering what you thought this meant for the future, um, and will there be some learnings for the parties um, looking at the experiences of Goldbach, um, the Etiga, um, and Partner Democrat? Will they look and see that if they don't join the government in coalition early, they're either going to be coerced into joining later um, or destroyed or seriously weakened. And so will they look at this option at the beginning um, of each presidential term and say, actually the best bet is if we join the coalition now um, and get some first move or early mover advantage from doing that. Right, so first two years, I'm not entirely sure whether I fully understood the question, but I mean, there were several occasions now where Jokowi has used this massive coalition to his advantage and to secure the economic social agenda that he wants to push through. Uh, the omnibus bill was only able to be pushed through because the coalition was almost fully behind it. And I was surprised about the level of unity uh, in the coalition about that, especially PDRP at the beginning had expressed really serious doubts, as you would expect from a party that is Sukarnoist and protectionist in in nature, right? So the, the very early discussions of the omnibus bill, uh, the members of, of PDIP were very skeptical. I said, no, we don't want that. But when it came to voting day, 
everyone in the government, plus Pan, were on board. Right? It was only Democrat and uh, PKS that were not. Right? And, and one of the theories is it was then the suspicion that Yudhiyono financed some of the street demonstrations against the omnibus bill that led Jacobi uh, to his anger over over, over part of the Democrat. Also think about the change in the KPK law, right, which clearly uh, Jacobi endorsed yeah, and was put through Parliament in rapid and in, in record time. Right? So, so this is how he's using this massive coalition. Yes, it might be a drag at times, but it gives him a, an instrument, a legislative instrument that uh, very few other presidents had. So Charlie's question, I think, is a very good one. And of course, that's sort of our concern, right? So generally, at looking at Indonesian politics, already there are even observers coming out, Ekodari, uh, saying, well, let's just have Jokowi and Pabo running together in 2024. Everything's over. The whole sort of single candidate debate, Chalon Tungal, you know, this is uh, very concerning. Now, is there even a space for opposition in the Indonesian uh, political system, in the Indonesian political culture at the moment? Again, the lesson that I think Indonesian parties and the government should be learning from this is just get rid of that authority for the government to decide the outcome of these party disputes. And then you, you, know, you, you get rid of much of the problem uh, with a very simple, simple change in the legislation. And with that, we're virtually out of time. So I'd like to thank you, Marcus, for the superb, superb presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, might I just remind people that tomorrow there is an online um, Indonesia project forum with Pat Murdiato, I think talking about HIV, uh, um, uh, AIDS, uh, HIV, um, uh, and next week there is another ISG seminar here, uh, which will be Ben Hegarty. Actually, Ben Hegarty is talking about HIV issues, and I think tomorrow it's something to do with the economy. Sorry, I'm a bit blurry. <laughs> Lecture by Chris Manning. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, now I understand what it is. Chris Manning. Okay, so Chris Manning's delivering the Bubiato lecture tomorrow. Thank you, Ibuzuli. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attendance, and we hope to see you again next week.